Hi, I've clicked on today's tropical tidbit for Monday, August 8th. If my voice chatters a little bit a little bit today, please forgive me. It's really cold here, 37 degrees this morning. Man, really cold. Winter's getting too close. Yeah, I know what most of you wouldn't give for 37 degrees right now, but it's a little bit chilly for me, a little bit too much, a little bit too fast. Hopefully it doesn't stay this cold for very long. All right, over here in the Atlantic, We've got nothing much going on right now. The deep tropics are fairly quiet for the moment. We are in a little bit of a downward MJO pulse, which means there's a lot of sinking air over the tropics for the moment. There is some dry air out there, a uh, Saharan air layer out in the central and eastern Atlantic, keeping things fairly quiet. We had Emily redevelop and then move out to the east-northeast under conditions that wouldn't allow her to strengthen a whole lot. They were going to be more favorable if she was still a developing storm coming into this area, able to butt up against this high over the Carolina but it wasn't enough after she dissipated and thus she couldn't do a whole lot on her way out and was not really a big deal just a few rain showers for this area in here we're now watching for Franklin and we are watching this wave south of the Cape Verde Islands tagged Invest 92L. NHC jumped right onto this as the GFS was forecasting development with this. And the ECMWF was also hinting at some mischief from this down the road. Both models have since backed off a bit. The GFS still keeps this a defined area of low pressure on its way west, but eventually fizzles it, probably due to this deep layer dry air mass off to the northwest of it, which is keeping convection down already. Most of the convection is confirmed find to the intertropical convergence zone and the monsoon trough over here and until it can get rid of this dry air perhaps farther west down the road this may be something to watch we will be watching the waves behind it too we got another one back here and some even more beefy ones over central africa that we can't see here and quite active over the next couple of weeks and we may have to start watching these waves as they come farther west as the steering pattern could take them pretty close to land before recurving and we may have to watch such things in the future this is the MJO forecast from the GFS. Here's where we are right now. Right in that middle area, kind of undefined, a little bit of sinking over the Atlantic right now. We're forecast to come out of it, and we've got other models that agree with the GFS as well, bringing us into octant 2 and 1 over the next couple of weeks, and these octants favor upward motion in the Atlantic Ocean, which means that thunderstorm activity will be promoted and allow a more favorable environment for tropical cyclones to develop. Now I wanted to show you guys something else today regarding the Texas heat wave and the drought, actually not so much the heat wave but the drought, although the two generally go together. This is the precipitation for Texas over the last century, I guess, all the way back to 1900 here. Here's the precipitation time series for the period of November through June, which is the period that we've had a dry Texas ever since November of last year. The last the last above average precipitation month for Texas was October 2010, if I did my homework correctly. And since November, we've had it very dry. And uh, you can see that way down here, 2011, this is a record right here according to this chart. And we're way down there. Now we're going to look at this compared to the only few years since 1950 that have actually been able to be compared to this. The only three years that even come close to comparing to this year are 1996, 1971, and 1956. And if we look at those hurricane seasons, if we look at 1956, we don't see a whole lot of storms here. We did have a hurricane landfall on the Gulf Coast, only one, but notice how the tracks are fairly far west here, pretty close to land, and if we go to 1971, we had three hurricane landfalls, two on the Gulf Coast, one on North Carolina, and again, you can see a lot of the tracks pretty far west here. And then if we go to 1996, this is a much stronger year with an active Cape Verde season track style right into the North Carolina area and two strong hurricanes made landfall, a major and a category two. Now what's interesting about these years is that they all favor tracks towards the west here, but look, you might say, well, these two seasons are pretty weak here. 56 and 71, not big deals here. Although 71 did have three hurricane landfalls, they were generally weak hurricanes, and the entire, you don't see a lot of reds and oranges and pinks here indicating strong hurricanes. Lots of depressions, storms, and cat ones, and that was about it that year. But let's look at the sea surface temperature anomalies for these years. If we go to 1956, 1956 was a third year La Nina, 
and thus there was a lot of heat taken out of the tropics and notice how cold the sea surface temperatures were in june and july the prime years before hurricanes cool things down things were already pretty cold in the atlantic in 1956 now 1971 was a second year la nina in a cold amo which favors a cold atlantic and that's what we had right in here very cold tropical atlantic now if we look at 1996 we get into some warmer stuff here second year la nina warm amo the tropical atlantic is a lot warmer so if we look at this we have 1956 cold atlantic fairly weak season but tracks focused pretty far west 1971 cold atlantic pretty weak season but tracks focused fairly far west 1996 warm atlantic and then a really beefy season aiming major hurricanes at the united states eastern coastline and the northeast caribbean islands and the bahamas here so now if we have this and then we look at this year june and july look at what we have a very warm atlantic tropical basin so if we put the pieces together here should we be concerned I would say yes, because if we have this kind of a pattern, we have all these teleconnections, and then we throw in this Texas precipitation with all the drought, and then we look at the previous droughts, we see that the droughts favor tracks pretty far west towards this area of the world in the southwest North Atlantic, and then we look at what happened here, the two weak years in that package had a cold Atlantic, but as soon as you flip the Atlantic to warm, we get a really nasty season aiming strong storms towards land and then this year we have that kind of a warm ocean if not warmer than 1996 sorry my hand is wobbling like i said i am shivering it's pretty cold here so this is the kind of pattern this is just one more piece to that puzzle that we're putting together that means that we should probably watch for this season to have the kind of track congregation coming out of the deep tropical atlantic that could threaten the eastern seaboard the caribbean maybe even the gulf of mexico depending on how the texas ridge evolves this year as i've been saying since the beginning we're looking for a higher impact year we're not we may not have as many numbers as last year. I still don't think we'll get to the kind of numbers we had last year, although NOAA's new range puts us all the way up to a possibility of 19 named storms like we had last year. But in general, I think less activity more aimed at land here. And we've already had a storm affect the United States, Dawn, and we had Emily aiming pretty close here. So it's not like the steering pattern doesn't favor storms coming in this direction. And we're now entering August and September when we're going to start to look out to this source region for strong storms to develop and head their way west northwest and eventually we may have some of these affect the united states coastline and the caribbean islands and i believe we will at some point this year so hopefully everybody is prepared all right that's it for today thanks for watching